On the third Thursday of every month, pastors and church leaders from near and far gather together for a time of friendship, gospel encouragement, and ministry insights in the warehouse at the Axis Church in downtown Nashville. The following is from one such third Thursday gathering. Okay, what kind of man does God use? Here's why that question matters. That question matters because you matter. You matter more than you know. Let me explain what I mean. Ryan, can I borrow you for a second? Come on up here. Okay, Ryan Brewer. Let's, here's, here is right here to my immediate right, this man matters the way you do. Let me explain why. At two levels. One, creation. Two, redemption. One, creation. This man was handmade by Almighty God. Now, if up on the wall there we had a Monet original, we wouldn't touch it, but we'd want to get up close to it and see the very brush strokes of Monet. This man, like you, is a divine original. The brushstrokes of God are all over this man. That's creation, redemption. This blood-bought, spirit-indwelt man, to my immediate right, in him, in a way we don't understand but is real, the very spirit of God dwells. There is within this man right here enough divine power to renovate the universe as the new heavens and the new earth, which the Lord will do. When we see one another with those biblical eyes, we realize every guy here we don't have a red S on our chest. Nobody's a Superman here. But everybody's amazing. You're a divine original. You are a location of the holy and the powerful. You are a location of the future, even in the present. When Cornelius bowed down before the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 10, that was not a good thing to do. You know, it was a bad idea. Peter corrected him, but... If in perceiving your brothers in Christ, you have never been tempted to bow down, do you understand who these guys are around you? We should never do it. But we should probably be tempted to. Thank you. You and I, by God's grace, for his glory, by virtue of creation and redemption, are amazingness brilliantly disguised as ordinariness. Every guy here matters. So this question, what kind of man does God use? That's consequential. Now, before we jump into it, two things. One, a shameless plug. Yesterday, my dear wife's book, Help, I'm Married to My Pastor, launched at Amazon. I'm going to write the sequel, Help, I Am the Pastor. <laughs> and, you know, she wrote this because ministry wives can often feel um, invisible, not understood, not noticed, and taken for granted. She wrote this book so that your wife will feel less invisible and more understood. So I commend it to you. And she gave me the privilege of writing the foreword. It's really a great book. And then, okay, I, I totally didn't uh, plan on saying this. This is not a shameless plug. This is me being ridiculous. But uh, Jeremy mentioned our iPhones and, and how significant they've become, how incredibly useful they've become. And I found, guys, um, I was shocked 
to notice my phone records how long, <clears throat> how much time I actually spend looking at it every day. Excuse me. <clears throat> and I, I was embarrassed with what I, I found. So <clears throat> I need my iPhone, my smartphone. Um, it, it, I finally realized what it is. We call it a phone. It is not. I know what a phone is. It's a thing that sits in the kitchen and you lift it up and you turn, you know, you do this. That's a phone. An iPhone is a portable computer. I finally realized that's what it is. It does everything. It does too much, and it's too convenient. And it was bringing me down. It was claiming too much for itself, eating into my life. I was not doing enough reading. I was not doing enough meditating. I was not doing enough paying attention to human beings. And I was staring at that blankety-blank screen. So this is what I carry with me now every day. I've got two phones. I made the financial commitment. And this is an incredibly tiresome. Remember these things? <laughs> Technically, I mean, they say you can text on it, but it's such a pain that I don't. What this does, this is a phone. I can talk to people on the phone, and then it behaves itself, and it shuts up. I recommend it. All right, now, what kind of man does God use? I was thinking about it all night, guys, and I woke up this morning, and, and this happened on my laptop. I'm a nerd. I don't know how not to write papers. So I've written a paper. Can I read you my paper? Is that okay? Okay. All right. What kind of man does God use? There are many ways we could answer that question. It's a vital question. For example, we could turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. God uses a disciplined athlete, a, a good soldier, a diligent farmer. We could go to Psalm 1. God uses the man, the blessed man, who delights in the law of the Lord. We could go to so many passages that we get good answers. Wherever we turn for the answer to the question, what kind of man does God use? We know this. We're not talking about what kind of man deserves God's blessing. We're not talking about merit. We're talking about openness. We are gospel men. To us, Jesus is everything. We see everything through the lens of the finished work of Christ on the cross and the endless power of the Holy Spirit with nothing added in of our own deservings, our own merits, our own causations, and so forth. We don't complicate it. Jesus is everything. But we are asking, on terms of God's grace, what kind of man does God use? And the answer I've chosen for us today is just basic and obvious, and all of us would agree on it. It's not a denominational option. This is just Christianity. Faith and repentance. God will use a man of faith and repentance. The Bible says the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The Apostle Paul, that's Mark 1. The Apostle Paul summed up his ministry this way, testifying both to Greek, Jews and to Greeks. In other words, this is my message, message to everybody, testifying to repentance toward God and to faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, Acts chapter 20. The Westminster Confession of Faith teaches us repentance unto life is a grace the doctrine whereof is to be preached by every minister of the gospel as well as that of faith in Christ. So that's mainstream, non-weird doctrine coming right out of the Reformation flow, which is where we belong. God can use a man of faith and repentance. Let's take the two in order. One, God can use a man of faith. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. The reformers saw that faith as so central to authentic Christianity that they spoke of faith alone as the key that unlocks the door to everything desirable and worthy. Jesus said, believe in God, believe also in me. Paul said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Faith 
is treating God as real. More real than all this world of fraudulence, disappointment, and false appearances, which means faith in God is bold. Faith is audacious. Faith laughs. Charles Wesley wrote, faith, mighty faith, the promise sees and looks to that alone, laughs at impossibilities and cries, it shall be done. How could God use a man who treats God as one variable among others, limited, needing the cooperation of others, needing the stimulus of others, needing the advice of others? That isn't who God is. God is, according to the Westminster Shorter Catechism, this is a mouthful. The question is, what is God? Answer? That is an amazing question. What is God? That's the question of all questions. Here's the answer. God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. There's a lot to him. Have we ever once in all our lives thought of God and treated God as he fully deserves? I have not. The real enemy of our ministries is not out there in the world, but inside here in our hearts. Our small thoughts of God, our unbelief. I'm going to guess for every guy here, the, in your circle of friends, the most exciting, the most stimulating, the most life-giving man you know is the guy who treats God as real. You love to be around that guy. There's a radiance about him. There's an energy about him. He's not wringing his hands, wondering, oh, poor God, what's he going to do next? Men like that just flat out believe and they treat God as real. Man, that's what we need in our city today. Jesus said, according to your faith, be it done for you. The Bible also says Jesus did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. When Jesus looks at our unbelief and hardness of heart, he does not say, gosh, guys, I really understand how hard it is for you to treat me as real. Gosh, I'm so sorry. The Bible says he marveled because of their unbelief. In other words, guys, you got to be kidding. You really think I'm that pathetic? When the Apostle John in Revelation chapter 1 saw Jesus as our Lord is now in his ascended glory, when John was probably his closest personal friend, his most intimate personal friend during his earthly years. Now that close personal friend sees Jesus as he is right now. Remember what happened? John passed out. Let's not coddle our unbelieving hearts. Let's rebuke our unbelieving hearts and dare. Let's give the devil a really bad day. All kinds of heartburn. And let's just dare, flat out dare, to treat the living Christ as real, more real than any, everything that's against him. Because he is. In the first issue of Christianity Today magazine in 1956, Billy Graham was instrumental in launching the magazine Christianity Today. 
And he had an article in that uh, first issue. And he wrote in that article about the turnaround moment in his life in 1949. Okay, back, back story. You might remember that in 1949, in September, October 1949, in Los Angeles, Billy Graham had been going around with the Youth for Christ organization, preaching and so forth around the country. But God detonated the, the Billy Graham phenomenon in September, October 1949 in Los Angeles. And that was back in the day where they would set up a tent on an empty lot and put up signs and people would come and hear the preacher. That's what they did. But God said, hey, guys, <laughs> it's time. Watch this. Okay? Now, that was the back, back story. About six weeks before that crusade, they called it a crusade back in the day, before that began, something happened in Billy Graham's life about faith. And he wrote in the article, in 1949, I'd been having a great many doubts concerning the Bible. I thought I saw contradictions in Scripture. Some things I couldn't reconcile with my restricted concept of God. When I stood up to preach, the authoritative note so characteristic of all great preachers of the past was lacking. I was waging the intellectual battle of my life. The outcome could certainly affect my future ministry. In August of that year, I was invited to Forest Home the Presbyterian Conference Center, high in the mountains outside Los Angeles. I used to go to Forest Home Camp in high school. I've been there. I remember walking down a trail, tramping into the woods, and almost wrestling with God. I dueled with my doubts. My soul seemed to be caught in the crossfire. Finally, in desperation, I surrendered my will to the living God revealed in Scripture. I, he put his Bible open on a stump in the woods. I knelt before the open Bible and said, Lord, many things in this book I do not understand, but you have said the just shall live by faith. All I have received from you, I have received by faith. Here and now, by faith, I accept the Bible as your word. I take it all. I take it without reservations. Where there are things I cannot understand, I will suspend judgment until I receive more light. If this pleases you, give me authority as I proclaim your word that through that authority and through that authority convict men of sin and turn sinners to the Savior. And then he says, within six weeks, we started the Los Angeles ministry, which is now history. During that crusade, I discovered the secret that changed my ministry. I stopped trying to prove that the Bible was true I had settled it in my own mind that it was true. And this faith was conveyed to the audience over and over again. I found myself saying, the Bible says, totally Billy Graham, right? I felt as though I was merely a voice through which the Holy Spirit was speaking. A crusade scheduled for three weeks lengthened to eight weeks with hundreds of thousands of people in attendance. The people were not coming to hear great oratory, nor were they merely interested in my ideas. I found that they were desperately hungry to hear what God had to say through his holy word. I found that I could take, and I'm not recommending this method of preaching and organizing a sermon, but God, God mercifully, God has mercy on all of us when we preach. I found that I could take a simple outline and put a number of pertinent scripture quotations under each point, and God would use this mightily to cause people to make full commitment to Christ. I found that I did not have to rely on cleverness, oratory, psychological manipulation of crowds, or apt illustrations, or striking quotations from famous writers. I began to rely more and more upon scripture itself. And God blessed. God can use a man of faith. I heard Billy Graham preach many times. 
I heard my dad preach many times, of course. I heard Francis Schaeffer, Bill Bright, and other giants of their generation. And they are why I cannot preach a sermon to this day without saying many times, the Bible says. And that utterance in the course of a sermon that I preach is not a step toward finality and certainty than is then established on some other basis. But the Bible says is the very foundation of certainty. And God blesses. God blesses our faith in his word because that is how in preaching we ourselves treat God as real. We can preach by faith. Now, I'm not qualification. I'm not invalidating apologetics. Apologetic lines of reasoning, apologetic evidences, and so forth. But what does apologetics properly accomplish? All apologetics can do. I'm not disparaging apologetics, guys. There's, that's got to be a, a very clear component in our preaching today. Because people bring into the hearing experience, into the uh, receiving the gospel with all kinds of preconceptions that are just wrong, barriers and, and, and uh, obstacles to faith. But all apologetics can do is remove those barriers. Just get them out of the way. Apologetics is a deconstructive exercise. It cannot positively create certainty. Only the positive proclamation of the gospel can create faith, certainty, finality. Here I stand. Our part is not to hinder the ministry by treating God as if he needs to be propped up by our brilliance. Our part is to declare Christ tenderly and joyfully as the all-sufficient Savior of broken sinners. And the Holy Spirit will bless that faith with power from on high. So God can use a man of that faith. All right? That's my first of two points. Number two. God can use a man of repentance. Jesus, according to Matthew's gospel, set the tone of his whole ministry with these words. In Matthew chapter 4, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There's new sheriff in town. God is starting. He's pushing new dominoes over. There's only one way to enter in. There's only one way to respond. Repent. Paul summarized his message this way that everyone should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. And in his seven letters to the churches of Asia Minor in Revelation 2 through 3, isn't that interesting? We have the letters of Paul, we have the letters of John, we have the letters of Peter, and we have the letters of the risen Jesus. Seven of them in Revelation 2 through 3. There's a killer sermon series right there, guys. By the way, uh, if you do that series... Um, John Stott has a fantastic book on those seven letters entitled, What Christ Thinks of the Church. And there are some other great books, too. John Stott, What Christ Thinks of the Church. What a fascinating title, right? So in those seven letters, the risen Christ calls his churches to repent eight times. Repentance starts when we become honest before God. Repentance is a frank and blunt reappraisal of ourselves and our failings with complete openness to going back, restarting, making things right again, whatever the cost, because nothing matters more to us than getting right with God and with one another. Nothing matters more. How could God use a man who is shoving his betrayals down into denial and evasion and avoidance and smiling on the outside while slowly dying on the inside? 
How can God use that kind of man since God's purpose is to bring the whole world back home to himself through honest repentance? Repentance is how we start with Christ. Repentance is how we go on with Christ. The whole length of our journey as Christians is marked by repentance. It, in Ephesians chapter 4, for example, being renewed in the spirit of our minds. The spirit of our minds is our disposition, our emotional tilt, our vibe. Being renewed in the spirit of our minds, putting off the old self and putting on the new self. That's repentance. Guys, maybe I'm way, way, way off, but let me just toss this out there. Would I seem crazy to you if I said the most striking feature of Nashville Christianity is our lack of repentance? Orthodoxy, we got a lot of it. Cool, got a lot of that. I've never seen such cool churches in all my life. Great music, wow, off the charts. Repentance? Hmm. I wonder if our attitude, wait on deep, might be something like, you know, the show must go on. How can God send revival to us since revival empowers repentance? If that's not on the table, and guys, where we want to be before the Lord is we put everything out on the table before him. And he calls the shots. And if repentance is not on the table, how can God use us to spread repentance? Let me paint the picture. This is a true story from Korea in 1907. There was a group of, it was a national Christian gathering in the capital city in 1907. It was, it was men only. There wasn't enough room for others. And of course, this was a culture in which the men especially didn't admit anything. Nobody loses face. This is a culture of honor versus shame. During their meetings that year in 1907, God met with them in a deeper way. And they experienced the visitation of God upon them and through them upon the nation. And it was through that revival in 1907 that God prepared Korea for several decades of Japanese occupation. And they got through it because God dealt with them and helped them and refreshed them and strengthened them and visited them in 1907. So um, there was a Presbyterian missionary there and he left an eyewitness account of what happened. And this was not the only time it happened, but this was the final night of this series of meetings. Here's what he said. Then began a meeting, the like of which I had never seen before, nor wish to see again, unless in God's sight it is absolutely necessary. Every sin a human being can commit was publicly confessed that night. Pale and trembling with emotion, in agony of mind and body, guilty souls standing in the white light of their judgment saw themselves as God saw them. Their sins rose up in all their vileness till shame and grief and self-loathing took complete possession. Pride was driven out. The face of man forgotten. Looking up to heaven, to Jesus, whom they had betrayed, they smote themselves and cried out with bitter wailing, Lord, Lord, cast us not away forever. Everything else was forgotten. Nothing else mattered. The scorn of men, the penalty of the law, even death itself seemed of small consequence if only God forgave. We may have our theories of the desirability or undesirability of public confession of sin. 
I've had my opinions. But I know now that when the Spirit of God falls upon guilty souls, there will be confession, and no power on earth can stop it. What if God visited us in Nashville? What if that happened here? What if that upheaval wrecked some of our church plans? What if all we had to do, our, 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 our schedules were just crowded for the next six months with just meeting with people? Getting down on our knees together in prayer, praying, making things right, opening up, owning up. Going around and repairing relationships and admitting failure, admitting sin. What, what if God swept all of our purposes aside, all of our expectations, and for six months just washed us clean? We'd be ready for anything. We'd be ready for the hard times that are coming. And is anything else going to get us ready? The Bible says, repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. And not only blotted out, in God's sight above, but blotted out in our experience, blotted out in our consciences, blotted out in our emotions, blotted out in our relationships, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Thanks. God be with you, man.